Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, June 9th. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. We open with accusations of criminal activity against Likud MK Oren Khazan, who Channel 2 reported had used and supplied the hard drug crystal meth and arranged prostitutes for visitors to a casino he managed in Bulgaria. Knesset Speaker Yulia Edelstein today told Khazan, who also serves as Deputy Knesset Speaker, that, given the allegations, he will not be leading plenary sessions until further notice. Khazan is preparing a libel suit and says the accusations are just the sick imagination of the media. In a radio interview, he said he was ready to take a polygraph to prove his innocence. In the report, several witnesses were interviewed who said they saw Khazan use the drug and that he also took the equivalent of about 1,200 shekels for each of the women he arranged as escorts. Opposition leader Isaac Herzog criticized the prime minister, saying that there are serious allegations against a member of his party, and he remained silent. The movement for quality government is calling on Netanyahu and the general security services to consider if Khazan can sit in the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, taking into account the pending accusations against him. Defense Minister Moshe Yalon today cautioned against the notion of a Palestinian state in the West Bank, stressing that he did not believe that a stable peace agreement could be reached in his lifetime. Speaking at the Herzliya conference, Yalon called instead for a realistic modest vivendi not rooted in impossible goals that could cause instability. Yalon's remarks mirrored contentious comments made by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in the run-up to national elections in March that are continuing to cause friction with the Obama administration. Yalon said in his speech that if Israel had agreed to the proposal to not allow Israeli security forces to operate freely in the West Bank, there would be Hamastan there and the situation would be similar to that in the Gaza Strip. A small political storm broke out in the Knesset after Merit submitted a proposal that would require manufacturers to mark the city where the product was made. Here with the details is Ellie Walgalanter. While the government continues fighting Palestinian efforts to delegitimize Israeli communities across the Green Line, as well as the worldwide BDS movement, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu now finds himself fighting that battle against political parties inside the Knesset. A proposal to amend the consumer protection law submitted by all the Knesset members of the Merit's party would require manufacturers to mark the city where the product was produced. The party issued a statement saying it was important to know whether the product was made, quote, inside Israeli jurisdiction or in territory held by Israel by way of occupation. This is the third time that Meretz has submitted this proposal, and the bill is likely to be rejected as the others were. Despite this, it will go before the Knesset, and that has provoked outrage among politicians. At the beginning of the Likud faction meeting at the Knesset, Netanyahu addressed the issue, saying... The state of Israel is in a battle against attempts to boycott it in the international arena. I am encouraged by the unity on the right and left in the efforts against these boycotts. I am also encouraged that legislation against this phenomenon began to pass in the U.S. and that will help our international effort. However, I was surprised to discover that one of the factions submitted a proposal for marking products. I asked them to remove the proposal. As the poet Erez Biton said, whoever starts to mark products is destined to mark people. We must stop it now. Merit's chairwoman Zahava Galon claimed that the Israeli government already marks settlement products as part of its trade agreement with the European Union and the OECD. Science, Technology and Space Minister Danny Danone of Likud told Arut Sheva that Merit's initiative is unacceptable and vowed to fight it. At the same time that we are fighting BDS, we are fighting the anti-Zionist, anti-Semite, we see a faction in the Knesset, the Merit's party, supporting legislation to mark products from Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. This is unacceptable. We will not even discuss it. And I say, in my position in the Legislation Committee of the government, I will not allow even a discussion in this issue. I call the MK of Merit to take back this proposal. We don't want to see it here in the Knesset, and we don't want to see it in any other parliament. The issue of boycotting Israel and the fight against the worldwide BDS movement continues to make headlines. Visiting former French President Nicolas Sarkozy condemned any support for boycotting Israel's democracy. Meeting with President Ruben Rivlin at his residence in Jerusalem, Sarkozy said, We come here as friends to a country that I love greatly. I would like to say how thoroughly we condemn, without equivocation, any backing for a boycott aimed at Israel's democracy. 
Rivlin told Sarkozy that the international pressure on Israel will not stop the tragedy between Israel and the Palestinians. I really think that the words should be said that boycotts or pressure, international pressure, uh, appealing to the international uh, organization could not bring us to the possibility of bringing to an end this tragedy only by direct negotiation we couldn't achieve that. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Chief Rabbi Emeritus of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth, told Arut Sheva that the ongoing battle against boycotting Israel needs to be broadened beyond BDS and anti-Semitism. I think we have to move the conversation on to the defense of religious liberty throughout the world. There are Christians being persecuted, murdered, driven out of their homes throughout the Middle East. There are Muslims who are the primary victims of radical political Islam. And I think just by focusing on Israel, anti-Semitism, BDS, it's a very small group of us against a very big world. We have to broaden the agenda, widen people's attention spans, create allies among the Christian and moderate Muslim communities and make Europe itself realize that if Europe is not safe for Jews, it is not safe for Europeans. And if we cannot defend Israel in Europe, then you will not be able to defend freedom. And according to a Peace Index survey of the Israel Democracy Institute and Tel Aviv University released today, just 10.5% of Israeli Jews stated that they would refuse to buy products labeled as settlement products. Laura? Thank you, Ellie. Israel and Jewish groups in the United States have slammed the U.S. Supreme Court's decision that Americans born in Jerusalem cannot be recorded as being born in Israel. The Palestinian Authority welcomed the ruling. We get more from IBA's Ari O'Sullivan. The family of Menachem Benjamin Zivotovsky from Beit Shemesh went all the way to the American Supreme Court with his fight, and his struggle failed. I'm an Israeli, and I want people to know that I'm glad that I'm an Israeli and that I'm not embarrassed by the fact that I'm an Israeli. The request was simple. Zivotovsky was born in Jerusalem and asked that his U.S. passport be recorded that his state of birth be Israel. But the American administration sees Jerusalem, whose borders are in dispute, and asked to refrain from registering a state. As it stands now, only the word Jerusalem is listed as their place of birth. We moved to Israel from America. We're still proud Americans. We're proud of the fact that you have such institutions in the United States. It's, it's rare today in the world. But we moved to Israel because we're proud of the state of Israel. And we're, we're honored to represent all of those Americans whose children were born in Jerusalem. And that it should say that they were born in Israel. The Supreme Court justices in a 6-3 ruling stuck with the Washington administration's position. The State Department was satisfied. The court's decision uh, in Zivotofsky uh, versus Kerry today confirms the long-established authority uh, of the president over the conduct of, dip of diplomacy and foreign policy. The decision also respects his ability to ensure that his determinations regarding recognition are accurately reflected in official documents and diplomatic communications, including uh, in passports. So uh, that's, that's our uh, reaction to the decision uh, announced uh, this morning. Justice Elena Kagan, writing for the majority, ruled that history has proven that anything dealing with the status of Jerusalem is a great matter. Jerusalem is a powder keg when it comes to questions about its status and access to holy sites, she wrote. But the deliberations were pertinent and judicial, dealing with who actually had the authority to rule in Jerusalem's status, the administration and State Department, or the Congress, which is now passing legislation that recognizes children of Jerusalem as Israelis. Writing for the minority, Justice Scalia said that the fact that the State Department believes it will anger the Palestinians is not relevant. That Palestinian Authority welcomed the ruling, saying it was an obvious message that Israel is an occupying power of eastern Jerusalem. U.S. Jewish groups like the ADL and the Conference of Presidents slammed the decision. M.K. Michael Oren warned it was damaging to Israel's sovereignty and its alliance with the United States. Law professor Alan Dershowitz also ridiculed the ruling. It's a terrible decision. The case should never have been brought because it gave the Supreme Court an opportunity to make some very bad law that will affect Iran. Now, whether or not Jerusalem is recognized officially by the State Department or by the President as the capital of Israel has importance and significance, but that significance pales by comparison with the importance of Congress 
having a role in not allowing the President of the United States to make a bad deal with Iran about nuclear weapons. And I'm afraid that this decision will embolden the President of the United States to say, look, foreign policy is within the office of the executive branch, not the legislative branch of the government. It's a misreading of the Constitution, it's a misreading of American history, and it's the wrong decision. The decision closes the door on the debate, for now. The Zivotovsky family fought their battle with the State Department, the Congress, the entire legal system in America, and now the Supreme Court. But for now, the verdict is final. An American child born in Jerusalem is not born in Israel. Ariel Sullivan for IBA News. In a damning account of conditions in Eritrea, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights accuses that government of possible crimes against humanity and called on the international community to protect Eritreans who fled their country. The report was welcomed by the large community of Eritrean asylum seekers here in Israel. We get more on this report by Dennis Zinn. The year-long investigation by the UN Commission on Human Rights lists a host of crimes perpetrated by what it calls the totalitarian rule of the Eritrean government, including murder, torture, rape and slavery. Some of these violations may constitute crimes against humanity. The UN Commission also accuses the Eritrean government of attempting to crush all opposition and dissent by carrying out a program of imprisonment, forced disappearance, surveillance and censorship. It noted that its investigators were prevented from entering the country. It is not surprising to us that these days a large proportion of those crossing the Mediterranean and using other irregular routes to reach Europe are Eritreans. They are fleeing a country ruled not by law but by fear. The report will certainly impact future Israeli policy regarding the 33,500 Eritreans seeking asylum. I, I was being persecuted, I was in, uh, in prison, also I was being also to send uh, like for punishment to the army. I was in army for three years. It was a uh, clear uh, slavery. I'm not working for my country or for my people. Human rights activist Asaf Weizen said it's clear that these people are not simply looking for a better standard of living. He said that the Israeli government was long aware that it would be inhumane to send these illegal aliens back to their country. Even if someone is denied refugee rights, in the decision to reject his asylum request, Israeli authorities are specifically saying because of the situation in Eritrea, we will not send you to Eritrea. But at the same time, they don't give the rights and recognition as a refugee. And this must be changed, because when people don't have rights and cannot support themselves, the entire community suffers. As yet, there's been no government response. Dennis Zinn, IBA News. If Israel and the Palestinians were able to make peace, Israel's economy would grow by an additional $123 billion over a decade. This according to a study released by the RAND Corporation, which examined the budgetary and economic costs of five different conflict relations scenarios over the next 10 years and compared them with a baseline scenario. The study included estimates of direct costs such as budgetary spending and those associated with violence, as well as opportunity costs such as investment and new market opportunities. The funeral for former Israel Beitenu MK David Rotem, who died of a heart attack at the age of 66 yesterday, will take place a short time from now in Efrat, from where the procession will continue to Kfar Etzion for his burial. Rotem leaves behind a wife and five children. He served as an MK from 2007 until this year and was known for the sharp barbs he directed at opposing MKs. He served as chairman of the Knesset Law, Constitution and Justice Committee and was also a member of the Judicial Appointment Committee. Rotem received praise from many politicians, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, his party chairman Avigdor Lieberman, and Knesset Speaker Yudele Edelstein, who said he was one of the hardest working and esteemed MKs and an active and influential lawyer for Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. Sport and Culture Minister Mary Regev continues to make waves in her new position. Speaking today as a guest at the Cinema South Film Festival in Sterot, Regev said that her office, while it will ensure a wide and diverse range of cultural events, will not support artists who act to delegitimize the state of Israel and IDF soldiers. Her speech was greeted with boos from the audience, and one of the professors at the Sapir College, who produces the annual event, interrupted her speech and said that her statements hurt freedom of expression. 
Just two weeks ago, the minister was caught in the middle of another storm when popular singer Shalom Chanoch had at first demanded that Regev not speak at the opening of the Israel festival, and there too her speech was met with hecklers when she went on stage. The foreign ministry recently hosted the fifth global forum for combating anti-Semitism in Jerusalem, where Canadian Minister of State for Multiculturalism, Tim Uppel, discussed the situation in his nation with IBA's Ellie Wagelanter. We have a very uh, thriving uh, Jewish community in Canada. Uh, we had over uh, 40,000 uh, Holocaust survivors that came to Canada and uh, estab you know, established themselves and, and established a very vibrant uh, community right across the country and uh, are an integral part of, of Canada. Um, we are unfortunately seeing, uh, according to Bene Birth Canada, a, a rise in, in, in reported incidents of, uh, of anti-Semitism. That's a concern uh, to us as a government and uh, we are uh, looking in ways that we could take steps to address that. Education on one side, which we've always uh, been strong advocates of, of, of education, of um, uh, Holocaust education, um, ed educating, uh, create, having more interaction between communities um, to uh, kind of bring down those, those barriers and, 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 and to shine a light on, on some of the, uh, the misinformation and the lies and that, that lead to uh, these kind of, this type of anti-Semitism incidents. But also on, on very practical notes of, of uh, providing uh, synagogue with uh, support for uh, putting up vi uh, cameras for security or, 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 or uh, um, a security fence. So uh, there's, there's a number of different ways that we're trying to address uh, this uh, concern that we have, that a very real concern that we have of anti-Semitism in, in Canada. How concerned are you about the infiltration of Muslim extremism into Canada? We take um, that possibility uh, very seriously, and, and we have had, um, uh, we, obviously we've had our own uh, incidents of uh, terrorism in Canada by jihadists. Uh, jihadists uh, have declared Canada uh, a target. They uh, have declared war on Canada. Uh, this is uh, one of the reasons that Canada is a partner um, uh, in um, the war on, in uh, Syria and Iraq against ISIL. Um, within our own country, we have uh, uh, brought in legislation to give our um, police forces and our intelligence agencies better tools, stronger tools to deal with um, uh, you know, what you're talking about, extremism, to ensure that Canadians are, are kept safe. We want to, to know, uh, be able to stop Canadians from leaving Canada and going abroad to be trained as terrorists. Um, we want to stop and take down websites that uh, would be trying to recruit young Canadians into, uh, into their terrorist organizations. And, um, and, and so those are steps that we're taking to uh, keep Canadians safer. You talk about increasing security, installing cameras at Jewish institutions, synagogues, schools. Is there a th direct threat to the Jewish community of Canada? I, I, unfortunately, I think um, the, the, uh, the, the fact that there could be an attack has already happened, and I think that's, uh, that is a possibility. And so I, I spoke to uh, the World Jewish Congress uh, today, and, and, and they were telling me that you know, even in Canada, they are speaking to uh, d their, uh, the different Jewish institutions, whether it be synagogues or children's schools or um, community centers, about their security situation. And um, from what I'm being told, that uh, a large part of the budget for Jewish organizations is uh, security. So they have private security guards that uh, you know, are there during uh, certain events. And so uh, this is a, a, a very uh, real concern. Why is it important that Canada be represented at this conference here this week? I, I, I think it's important for Canada to be uh, represented at, at, at a very important uh, conference on um, the world coming together and, and addressing uh, anti-Semitism, which, you know, we unfortunately uh, we are seeing uh, a rise in it, and and, and just what we will be what we're seeing in Europe recently, we're, we definitely need to uh, work to address this. Canada has taken it very seriously. We've been uh, part of some very, um, uh, have chaired the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, um, uh, anti-Semitism uh, conferences, and also just recently we had a, uh, a take note debate on uh, anti-Semitism as well to address concerns not only in Canada, but worldwide as well. 
In entertainment news, despite cancellations by artists from abroad who caved into boycott pressures, Art Garfunkel is in the country, and the audience is waiting eagerly for his concert tomorrow night at Bloomfield Stadium in Tel Aviv. Today, the musician visited with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in his official residence. The Prime Minister chatted with Garfunkel and showed him around. This is the first time the famous balladeer will be going on stage in Israel without his longtime partner, Paul Simon. In his press conference yesterday, he did promise his set list would include some of the duo's greatest hits. The 73-year-old said his son would appear alongside him and that he is just using the time ahead of the concert to rest and hang out. I'm not a star. I'm a singer who can sing very well if he can get his sleep and if he can get over jet lag. And this is my job. If any of you have any curiosity about this life I've been living for, for six decades of devotion to singing, please ask me. In local money matters, the Shekel was mixed in foreign currency trading while shares were down in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Here are the late afternoon numbers. Turning to the weather, and the forecast is calling for another drop in temperatures tomorrow. Here are the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. That's all for this newscast. Aaron Viner will be here tomorrow with more news from Israel and abroad. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield, wishing you a great evening and shalom from Jerusalem.